Our first presenter today is going to discuss reading the New Testament in the 21st century without losing your way. Dr. Michael F. Byrd is lecturer in theology at Ridley Melbourne College of Mission and Ministry in Melbourne, Australia. Dr. Byrd grew up in Brisbane before joining the Australian Army and served as a paratrooper, intelligence officer, and chaplain's assistant. He earned a PhD and Bachelor of Arts degree in Religious Studies from the University of Queensland and a Bachelor of Arts degree in Ministries at Queensland Baptist College. He taught New Testament at the Highland Theological College in Dingwall, Scotland, and has lectured extensively in North America, the UK, and Australia. He's the author of 10 books and has co-authored an additional eight books. And I may have that number slightly off, Michael, I took it off of I took it off of what I could find, so, so I hope I'm close. Um, Dr. Bird is currently editor for the Journal for the Study of Paul and His Letters and co-editor of the New Covenant Commentary Series. Dr. Bird describes himself as a biblical theologian, combining biblical studies and systematic theology. He believes that the purpose of the church is to gospelize, that is to preach, promote, and practice the gospel story of our Lord Jesus Christ. Dr. Bird is married to Naomi Bird, and they are proud parents of four children. Let us give a very warm welcome this morning to Dr. Michael Bird. Well, a warm good day from Australia. Uh, I, I have my own list of people to thank, so the Thanksgiving is going to continue. I have to thank the Reverend Steve Jester in the session here at Second Press for hosting uh, this event. Steve Schmidt, who we just heard from, and the Landrum uh, Educational Committee for organizing uh, the event. I also have to thank my esteemed colleagues who are here, including uh, Drs. Garrett, P Pennington, and De Silva for, uh, for joining us today. And I need to thank uh, many of you for coming as well. I'm sure there are other things that were going on uh, today. Uh, but there's some sort of uh, basketball game on that has some significance. Is this true? There's a basketball game on? Uh, yeah, well, go Cardinals. Um, and, uh, and who do we have here? Do we have do, do, do any people from uh, Louisville Seminary? Any seen people from there? Yeah, of course. Yeah. What, what about Southern Seminary? Anyone from there? We've got a few hands up. Good. Any any out of state visitors? I would I would try to guess who's the who's come the furthest away, but I'm pretty sure I will win that one. Uh, but today's topic is how to read the New Testament in the 21st century without losing your way. Now, uh, I don't know about you, but every now and again I come across people who look as if they have definitely lost their way when they've been reading the New Testament. And I, I've, I've, come, I've come across every now and again some interpretations that are a little bit, a little bit odd, a little bit out there, a little bit strange. And then you just get the downright wacky and weird. Uh, now, I, I came across one uh, chap who told me it was unbiblical to take out a mortgage. It's wrong because Paul says in Romans 13, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. So it is wrong to have a mortgage. Uh, when I was in the UK, I, I knew a couple who believed it was wrong for Christians to eat bread with yeast in it. And they appealed to 1 Corinthians 5, 9. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old bread, leavened with malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And I believe Christians should not have any type of leavened bread at all. My favorite story comes from a, a friend of mine when he, he was a Southern Baptist guy, uh, and growing up where he was in Georgia, there was a verse from 1 Corinthians that terrified him. There was a verse in the old King James that says, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. He took that to mean if he didn't get married, he was going to hell. So when he was in his young teenage years, he was definitely looking for a young wife because he thought his salvation rested on it. Uh, there are a lot of ways to lose your way. The best way to stop yourself losing your way is having a basic grasp on biblical interpretation. And that is generally called the science of hermeneutics. So what I'm going to do for the, for the rest of my time is talk a little bit about this, this, this beast, this entity called hermeneutics. 
And then I'm going to talk a bit about the, the actual art of biblical interpretation. I'm going to focus there on the prefatory matters. And then I'm going to offer a few brief practical tips of what we can do. So to begin with, we need to look at hermeneutics 101. Now, the first thing we have to do is to differentiate what is a biblical exegesis and biblical hermeneutics. I would say that biblical exegesis is the nitty-gritty hands-on study of the biblical text by the translation of the original languages, followed up with an analysis of the actual text. That's where you look at things like uh, genre, structure, uh, words, parallelism, alliteration, and you show how these units that we find in the Bible actually hold together, whether that's a, a parable or a psalm. In contrast, hermeneutics is a little bit broader than that. It's more about the science and philosophy of interpretation. You know, how do texts carry and convey meaning? Hermeneutics is the, the broader study focused on what we do with texts and how they lead us to find some sort of resonance or relevance in our own life. And interpretation is ultimately our attempt to find meaning in a text by decoding the message that's being encoded in the text by an author and then relating it to our own expectations and experiences. There are three components in interpretation. First, there is the author, a communicative agent who embeds a message in a text. That message may be something like, Jesus went to Capernaum, the word was made flesh. Second, there is the text itself, which is the system of signs that conveys the author's message. That's where we put all the letters together to make words, but it can include other things. The words can make metaphors and allusions. The text is the story world that we enter into when we read a gospel or an epistle or the apocalypse. Third, there is the reader. That's the party who appropriates the author's message found in the text. Now, something to remember, there are actually different types of readers. For example, you can talk about what's called the implied reader. That's, that's the sort of information that a text sort of suggests that the reader already has, like he knows or he or she knows Greek or knows about certain customs or believes Jesus is the Son of God. And then we can imagine the first readers of a text. And then we can actually read about the church fathers and what they thought when they read the text. And then there's contemporary readers of a text as well. To break that down, those three components, we could say that there is the world behind the text, which is the author and his or her context and their sources and their background. There's the world in the text, the story itself. And then there's the world in front of the text, which is the world of the readers. Now, some interpretive methods will focus on one of these different worlds. Some will focus on the author, some will focus on the text, and some want to focus on the reader. Let me give you some examples. Historical criticism tends to focus mainly on the author and the origins of a text to find its proper meaning. If we know what Mark's uh, intention was and where he got his material from, then we can understand the Gospel of Mark, so we're told. The problem is, however, uh, identifying authorial intention is not always that easy, as there can be a huge chasm between our world and the world of the author, a big historical and cultural chasm. Also, scholars can be grossly speculative in trying to determine and decide where an author got his or her information from, where did this tradition come from, and how much has the author of our text uh, edited. Further to that, sometimes authors can be quite opaque. For example, there's that passage in the Gospel of Marks where it talks about the young man who fled from the Garden of Gethsemane naked. I'll be perfectly honest, I don't have the foggiest clue what, what Mark was talking about, and I'm not too sure if anyone actually does. And sometimes authors can even be wiser than they know. For example, when Isaiah was talking about the suffering servant, he may be talking about himself as a prophet or the nation of Israel. He may have seen this in some sort of future sense, but he may not have thought it referring to the incarnate Son of God who would be the King of Israel and crucified for our sins. Uh, in a wider canon, that takes on new meaning, but that may not have been what Isaiah himself specifically had in mind. <clears throat> 
Because of that, many have abandoned the idea of authorial intent and historical background and said, well, let's just focus on the text we have in front of us. And they employ things like literary criticism and narrative criticism, which studies the text uh, independently of its authorial intention and historical background. It treats the text as, a, as, an, as an autonomous entity and concentrates how the story creates meaning through things like the, the narrator, uh, characterization, plot, and devices like irony and tragedy. The problem is that texts themselves can still be ambiguous or even vague. Stories can do multiple things and yield diverse perspectives. So we can still be at a stalemate even if we come to the study of the text. Well, then there came along a third type of criticism, focused more or less on the reader. This is often called reader response criticism. And this focuses on how the reader creates meaning for his or herself. Since the author can be remote to the point of irrelevance, and since the text can often be very open, interpreters then should focus on how the text resonates with them. And here one chooses to embrace the fact that we cannot escape our own pre-understanding that shapes or even skews our own view. So we might as well just embrace it. As a result, there are just as many interpretations as there are interpreters. There is no right or wrong interpretation on this view, just interpretations, plural. So you can have feminist interpretation, African-American interpretation, post-colonial interpretation, Marxist interpretation, even Australian interpretation. Of course, that's the correct one. The problem is that uh, more extreme views of reader response can lead to a type of uh, interpretive anarchy where the text basically means whatever you think it means. Uh, the only thing you find in the text is what you actually bring with you, and it treats the text as little more than a mirror. Now, in my view, uh, interpretation, that's ascertaining meaning. It's not just author, it's not just text, it's not just the reader. I, I would say it is about all three. We find meaning in the text by fusing together the horizons of author, text, and reader. We respect the intentionality of the author, the independence of the text, and the cultural ethos that the reader brings to the text. It is the spiral, the, the movement between these three components where meaning is found and created. You see, I think what makes an interpretation valid or pre preferable is when it explains something behind the text, something in the text, and something in front of the text. Interpretation is the web of meaning, the web of connections that we find between author, text, and readers. It's what provides coherence to all the things around us. And those connections, the more they are, the thicker they are, the more convincing an interpretation can be said to be. Let me give you an example of that by what I mean. Let's take a phrase like the righteousness of God that we find in Romans 1.17. Many trees have been sacrificed to write the tomes upon which people have argued about the righteousness of God. Is this a righteousness that comes from God to the believer? Is it an attribute of God? Is it God's distributive justice? Is it, is it a term referring to God's covenant faithfulness? Does it mean God establishing his justice throughout all of creation? What does it mean? Well, one thing I noticed when I read about the righteousness of God is it reminded me of Isaiah and the Psalms, where God's righteousness seems to refer to his saving activity or his saving power. And then one day I was reading through the Dead Sea Scrolls, you know, as one does, um, uh, where I noticed that uh, the same sort of language was used there in places like the community rule where again it seems to refer as a virtual synonym for salvation. And then I went back and read Romans and realized, well, that makes sense in the rest of Romans, not just in chapter 1, but in chapter 3 and in chapter 10. And, then, and, and in fact, in some other Pauline epistles as well, like 2 Corinthians 5, and then maybe Philippians 3 as well, I think it, it does make uh, sense. And then I read some of the church fathers who were a little bit more ambiguous on it, but, but some people like Ambrosiaster or, or, or Chrysostom, uh, 
And then I read a, a, another little textbook, a charming book on Romans by a chap, um, a young upstart, what's his name? Um, Tom Schreiner. Um, that was a joke, by the way. Um, uh, and, and I thought, wow, this guy's on the same level, so I, I guess I must be right. And, you know, and, and trying to preach and teach through Romans, it seemed to, it seemed to work. And so here's the idea where, where I was making an association between a phrase, and there was a number of connections I could make between the world behind the text, the, the historical context, the world in the text, and my own world. There, there were connections being made, and they seemed to, they seemed to be thick, and uh, be able to carry the freight I was attributing to them. Even so, we have to say that interpretation is always provisional rather than final, as we can, we can come across new information when we realize some of those threads we were making were actually a little bit flimsy. The connections were not that, were that certain, and, and they do not really hold the weight we attribute to them. Let me give you an example. For a long time, I thought Romans 7 was about the average Christian life. You know that wonderful passage, Romans 7, oh, wretched man that I am, that kind of a thing, who will save me. I, I, like many others, I assumed that that was referring to a, a, an average Christian. And it was very comforting to think that Paul went through the same struggles that I was going through. But then as I did more reading, I realized there's some things about that interpretation that's not right. For example, in Romans 6, Paul says we're no longer slaves to sin and the law. And yet the, the chap in Romans 7 definitely is a slave to sin and the law. Romans 8, we've got the Holy Spirit leading the Christian in righteousness and upright living, but there's no Holy Spirit in Romans 7. So I realized that the web of connections I made was actually quite flimsy, it was breakable, and I found a new way to hold all the pieces together in the text and around the text. Also, in other times, we can get new information that makes us recast or re-envisage our interpretation. Let me give you a, a couple of examples of that. In 1 Timothy 2.9, Paul says, I also want the women to dress modestly. Well, I assumed modestly refers to the, the amount of flesh one was showing. So I have a 14-year-old daughter who is being, now being noticed by 14-year-old boys. And the 14-year-old daughter has noticed that she's being noticed by 14-year-old boys. And, uh, and she, she, she doesn't mind the attention. Uh, but, you know, I make sure, you know, that, that miniskirt is not too short. You know, that kind of thing. But uh, someone pointed out to me, but here, modesty in 1 Timothy 2, 9, is not one the, the, the amount of flesh that is showing. It refers more properly to the amount of bling one is wearing. Uh, it's more about the, an economic modesty uh, than, say, a, a, a more a, a, a visible modesty. So I think, oh, well. I have to tell my daughter she can wear the miniskirt but no jewelry. <laughs> or to give another an example, uh, the NIV says in 1 Corinthians 11:5, "But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It's the same as having her head shaved." Um, however, the ESV says in contrast, "Every wife who prays or prophesies." So the ESV changed woman to wife. And I thought, well, why did they do that? Well, apparently a, an a Australian chap by the name of Bruce Winter, and let's face the fact, you want something done properly, you send in the Aussies. Uh, Bruce Winter pointed out, if you, if you look at, at, at inscriptions and in archaeology in Corinth, normally it was only wives who had to wear a head covering, uh, not, not simply all women, it was only wives. And so that, that was new information that meant the translation and the interpretation had to be recast. So to summarize this uh, crash course on hermeneutics, hermeneutics is about the fusing together of horizons of author, text, and reader. This fusion creates a web of connections that illuminates the author, provides coherence to the text, and opens up various applications for the reader. So that's the more global philosophical approach to how texts convey and create meaning. What I want to look at now is uh, how to interpret the New Testament itself. And I'm going to focus on, in two stages on the preparatory and then the practical. First of all, on the preparatory side, have a godly reverence for Scripture. We come to Scripture with a willingness to learn a readiness to hear what the Spirit is saying in Scripture, a humility to receive the Word, and a readiness to submit to God's Word. 
the great German New Testament scholar Adolf Schlatter was once asked if he stands on the word of God. And he said, no, I stand beneath it. We are free to ask questions. We are free to challenge received traditions. But if we are to be followers of Christ, then we are to revere the holy book that teaches us about Christ. Jesus is the word of God made flesh, and he had a very high view of the word of God in scripture. And followers of Jesus can hardly have a view of scripture different to what the Lord himself had. Scripture is authoritative, it is not negotiable. That doesn't mean you can cherry, so you can't cherry pick the parts of the Bible you want to believe. And yet we do not worship scripture, that would be bibliolatry. But we approach it with humility and obedience and treat it as, as it is the word of the Lord. Secondly, we should be prepared for transformation. You are not reading scripture certainly to learn facts about God or religion or to acquire knowledge simply about uh, biblical teaching. We read scripture to be changed by it, to be transformed by it. 2 Timothy 3.16, according to the uh, NLT, says, All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. The goal of our instruction in Scripture is to be shaped by it. So the story of Scripture becomes the story that we live by and the story that we live out. Scripture is key to our spiritual formation, our growth in Christ-likeness. Scripture is a vital part of our instruction so those who bear Christ's name learn to walk in Christ's way. It's a tragedy then when we, or if you sometimes come across someone who has a knowledge of scripture that is almost encyclopedic, freakish in their ability to recall Bible verses, people, and dates, and yet their character can often be arrogant, unkind, brutish, and downright dastardly. They know about the God of scripture, but they are nothing like the God of scripture. Bible knowledge is wasted if it does not cultivate the fruit of righteousness and the fruit of the Spirit. There's a great warning in John chapter 5 where Jesus says to the Pharisees, You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you, them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me and to have life. Knowledge can puff up. But knowledge of scripture should lead to love of God and love of neighbor. As the church father Augustine said, Therefore, whosoever thinks that he understands the divine scriptures or any part of them, so that it does not build up the double love of God and love of neighbor, does not understand it at all. What really determines whether you're a biblical interpreter is not so much what you know, but how you live. Third, be ready to study diligently. And we find good examples of people committed to the study of scripture. For example, there's Ezra, who we're told in Ezra 7, had devoted himself to the study and observance of the law of the Lord and to teaching its decrees and laws in Israel. And then there's the famous Bereans from Acts 17, where we are told now the Bereans were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica. For they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. We have to turn our minds to hear the word of the Lord and to listen what the Spirit is saying to the churches. I remember a story of a, uh, of a preacher and uh, someone came up, to his, uh, came up to him and often said, and said, Minister, I, I find your preaching it goes over my head. And his response was, have you tried lifting it up? If you put effort into reading a letter from your doctor or reading a contract from your attorney or instructions from an architect, then you should probably put the same amount of effort into your study of scripture and your daily reading. Now, this requires a regular reading of scripture, uh, meditation and reflection on it, listening to preachers and teachers, availing yourself to the resources you can find. And I'll be perfectly honest, if you go out and get a copy of Logos or Bible works, you have more 
information and resources at your fingertips than what most Christians have had for the last 2,000 years. You see, when it comes to getting a grip on Scripture, uh, attaining success as a uh, competent handler of Scripture, the only place where success comes before work is the dictionary. Um, that also was a joke. Um, I find my repertoire is narrowing by the minute. Uh, re recently, recently I, I, had a, I had a student email me, and this was a recent graduate of the college, and he was now in his first church. And uh, he emailed me and asked me a biblical interpretation question. That, that was it wasn't hard. It was relatively simple. And with, with a little bit of work, he could have found the answer himself. But he basically wanted the, um, the, uh, what I would call the drive-through service. And he thought he'd email his own prof. Where my idea of the theological education is I'm training men and women who can teach themselves and teach others. So I was a little bit cranky with him. Where three months after doing his degree, he emailed me. And I said, I wrote him an email saying, dear, stu dear student X, we seem to have a problem. The purpose of your last three years of theological education was that so you could answer questions like these. And therefore I am led to assume either A, you are a lazy sausage, or B, I am a bad teacher. I'll give you a hint, it's not B. So go back and do your own work, and if you're still stuck, then you can have it. The days of me giving you, uh, you know, um, theological McNuggets for breakfast every day are over. Yours in Christ, Mike Bird. <laughs> the other thing we do is to study Scripture as part of a community of faith. Um, oh dear, how do, how do I do this? In the Baptist tradition... There is, there is a thing called soul competency or soul liberty whereby each person is accountable to God rather than to family, church or denomination when it comes to interpreting the Bible. And it's a, it's a principle of religious freedom. While I agree with the uh, freedom principle of soul competency, I think it's important to stress that when it comes to interpretation, I have learned that some souls are more competent than others. Freedom to interpret scripture oneself is also a great opportunity to fall into error and heresy. So interpretation cannot simply be about God, the Bible, and me. Rather, it has to be about God, scripture, and us. Soul, competen soul competency needs to be balanced with Catholicity. Reading scripture as part of a church community where scripture is read, marked, learned, and digested. If we focus too much on our freedom to interpret the Bible without any guidance on this task from those around us or those before us, we are heading either towards a sectarian perspective or an arrogant disposition. We read scripture with the church around us, the local church, the wider church, the global church, and the, hist the historical church. We do that so we can learn from their wisdom and we would know God better. We shouldn't be like the type of person to whom Paul said in Corinth, did the word of God originate with you? Or are you the only people it has reached? And that reminds me of a charming story. There was, a, uh, there was once a preacher who got up and said, you know, when I prepared this sermon, I don't read any commentary. I don't consult any, any religious scholar, any of the words of man. I just read my Bible and wait for the Spirit to give me unction and to give me wisdom when I preach the holy word of God. And as the, uh, the minister was standing at the door, he, was, uh, he, uh, he met a young Presbyterian lass, a young Presbyterian girl. And he said to her, now what did you think of my sermon? And she said, oh, I, I wasn't listening to it. And he goes, well, why weren't you listening to it? And she said, well, why should I listen to you? You don't listen to anybody else. Good point. Uh, that's why with my own students, I stress the importance of tradition, your own, your own local tradition in your church and a wider tradition. You see, tradition is simply what the church has learned from reading scripture. Tradition is a tool for reading scripture. Now, tradition is not to be equated with scripture for sure, but we are foolish if we blindly accept tradition, if we, we are, but we are foolish if we blindly accept tradition and we are equally foolish if we ignore tradition. 
As Yaroslav Pelikan famously said, traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. Tradition is the living faith of the dead. We should listen to those who taught us the word of God and consider their wisdom and way of life. Uh, other thing we need to do is to acknowledge our own situatedness. It is inevitable that your own situation, by which I mean your life experience, your culture, your language, your history, even your skin color, can affect the way you interpret the Bible. We are all undoubtedly influenced by our presuppositions and biases. In fact, uh, last week I was in Houston, and it was my first time ever teaching African-American students. I've taught African students, I've taught American students, but I've never taught African-American students. And that was a new experience for me, and hearing about uh, what happens in their own communities and churches with the Bible and Scripture. You see, it's very easy to use the Bible as ready-made support for our preconceived views. And uh, I've seen this. I had, I had a, a strange experience just a week ago where I was in my hotel room and I was watching, ended up watching two different shows. They were both political with religious themes. The first one was by a chap by the name of Glenn Beck, uh, who's a right-wing Mormon um, who had some very interesting views and there was prayers at the end and there was, it was all God and politics. I thought, well, that was interesting. And I turned the channel, and then I'm watching this guy called Al Sharpton. And I went from one channel to the next, and this, this also was politics and religion, but he was on a different end of the spectrum to Glenn Beck. And uh, it was very interesting, but both saw religion as basically providing the capital for their own political viewpoints. We need to discover what our own biases are and consider how they can hinder our own growth into godliness. We need to do more than use the Bible for our own ends. We need to ask the question, is God really on our side? Am I reading the Bible because this is what it means to faithfully read the word of God? Or am I, cap or am I captive to my own culture? Whether that's left or right or middle or upside down, whatever it is. We need to ask, as Robin Burns said, what it would be like to see ourselves as others see us. The other thing we need to do as we approach scriptures, remember some parts are clearer than others. Protestants have traditionally maintained what is known as the clarity of scripture, so that even the most uneducated persons is able to grasp the meaning of scripture by this Holy Spirit's guidance without the need for a magisterium to explain it to him or her. I believe that is basically right. However, the Westminster Confession and the London Baptist Confession, and that's a pretty good coalition of Presbyterians and Baptists, their statements of faith both declare that the clarity of Scripture applies only to the things necessary for salvation. And it explicitly says that all things in Scripture are not plain in themselves and not clear to all. Uh, I've been in enough Bible studies and taught in enough seminaries to know that that is definitely the case. Some parts of scripture will be clearer than others and consensus will not always be easily found. Now, it is very easy to know what it is to get right with God because the Bible tells us clearly, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You don't need a PhD in biblical studies to figure out that. However, if you're reading the book of Revelation, then reading a book by a guy who's got a PhD I actually think might be a good idea. And I've got an excellent example here in David De Silva. Uh, so we... we we have to accept there are some bits that will be harder, some will be harder at work, and some places we may need to consult those who have dedicated themselves to the interpretive task. Or that's my way of trying to uh, and get my own job security. But it means diversity and disagreement about the meaning of Scripture will be commonplace, as it always has been in the history of the church. If you don't believe me, go and read the minutes of the Westminster Assembly. The upshot of that is we need to develop something that our President Moller of Southern Seminary called a triage of beliefs. We need to have beliefs that are primary and essential to the faith, those which are significant to church life but are secondary, and then those which are tertiary. We don't want to major on minor elements of biblical interpretation. Another thing we need to do then, and this follows, is we often need to learn to live with ambiguity. Precisely because some parts of scripture are clearer than others, we have to accept that not everything will appear to be black or white. I'll be honest, I can find some very good reasons in the Bible for being an Arminian. 
I can also find some very good reasons in the Bible for being a Calvinist. There are different ways of understanding Genesis 1 and each have their own relative merits. There are several positions on Christian ethics, each attempting to draw from Scripture, that have elements that in varying degrees are commendable. Now one might simply decide not to make any decision on a subject because it is so difficult and is so disputed. And there are some churches that do that. For example, the Salvation Army, because there's different views of baptism and the Lord's Supper, they've decided just not to have baptism or the Lord's Supper in their communities. I can see the attraction, but it's probably better to, with the spirits leading and with the wisdom we have, to make a call on these things, but to hold them with a degree of charity and to recognize that all interpretations are provi provisional. Now this should not be mistaken for some kind of covert justification for interpretive relativism uh, or even soul competency where everyone interprets the Bible however they, they like in their own freedom. Um, students who know me will know that I do not suffer fools gl uh, gladly and I have little patience for ideologues twisting scripture. What I'm suggesting is that an honest wrestling with scripture will mean that certainty on many topics will sometimes elude us. And that is why we need to pray for illumination. Reading the Bible is not a purely academic exercise. If you're not careful, it can become one. It's also a spiritual exercise. We need the Holy Spirit to bring understanding to our minds and the minds of our fellow believers. This is called illumination, with God enabling us to know and understand Scripture. When Jesus met his uh, disciples uh, in the upper room, Luke tells us that he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. We still need that today. And with that understanding, we can properly understand, with that understanding, we can grasp what it means to know God, to follow Jesus, and to be his people in this world. We should pray for the understanding, guidance, and illumination we need to grasp and apply scripture. So that was the preferatory element. On the more practical side, and here I have to admit I'll be more brief since I'm assuming my esteemed colleagues will have more to say on this. Um, on the practical side, uh, I get my students to remember C3. Now in military intelligence, that means command, control, and communication. That's not the C3 I'm talking about today. What, that, what I mean is context, content, and concern. When you're reading a text, whether that is a psalm, a parable from the gospel, or a vision from Daniel, or from the apocalypse of John, those are the three things you need to keep in mind. What is the context? What is the literary, historical, and cultural context of what I'm reading? What comes before it? What becomes after it? Uh, a wonderful Methodist scholar by the name of Ben Witherington has a little catchphrase he, he loves repeating. He says, a text without a context is a pretext to mean whatever you want it to mean. You know, it's context that creates meaning. And if you can grasp the context of the Bible, its historical context, its literary context, where it fits into the argument, you're halfway there to avoiding any major problems or errors. The second thing you should do is look at the actual content. And that is trace the flow of ideas and how they fit together. Most paragraphs, most units of discourse will have a main idea with supporting ideas. Simply sitting down and trying to ask what is the main idea, what is the big theme, is how you get into the body of a text. The other thing we need to ask is what is the concern? Why, why has Paul or Isaiah or Hosea or Luke put this passage here? Out of all the material they could have included, why have they included this text? What is at stake? How does this support their overall contention? What is affirm, affirmed? What is denied? If you go through that process of simply looking at the context, the content, and the concern, you are getting into the text in a responsible way that will avoid a number of errors. Look, I could, I could point you to a number of resources that I think can enable you to do that uh, in, 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 a, in a far more set out way. I've listed them for you in the handout. I certainly suggest if you have the time 
and the uh, resources that you avail yourself to those works. So thus far, and I'm heading towards the close now, uh, we, we've covered a, a bird's eye view of hermeneutics. We've covered how do texts carry, convey, and create meaning. And, we, and we've looked at this at the, at, the, at the using the horizons of author, text, and reader. We've also looked at a number of preparatory remarks about reading scripture with humility, diligently, and, and hard work, and praying for illumination. Uh, I've given a very, very quick rundown on, on the, the three important things about reading the Bible. C3, context, content, concern. I just want to finish with two final thoughts about reading scripture. Two final thoughts. First of all, if you go away from here remembering anything, it's that scripture should be treasured. While our Bibles often uh, gain dust and go unread, just a week ago, North Korea executed 60 persons for owning a Bible or Christian literature. There are people who are dying, literally, for holding a Bible. It's a crime, then, if our own Bibles go neglected. That's why we say in the Anglican tradition that Scripture should be read, marked, learned, and digested. The greatest reverence we can have for Scripture is by continually reading it. The second thing is, you know, we, we can haggle over the Bible and interpretations, but we should never forget the primary purpose for which Scripture was given. The Apostle Paul said in Romans 15, and I, I love these words, I love them, for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us. So that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. We can say a lot about the Bible as literature, history, theology. We can talk about hermeneutics until the cows literally come home. But above all, we have to remember that this is the book that gives us hope. In the darkest hours of despair and the blackest times of the night, this is the book that gives us the distinguishable hope that there is a God who loves us and nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And there I'll end. Thank you. Yeah, I think we're about 10 minutes for questions, uh, if there are any. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bird. Um, one of the slide the second hermeneutics 101 slide had the church fathers uh, with the dotted line question on that uh, for as a protestant what what are some recommendations you would have for uh, protestants who maybe are less familiar with the church fathers to become more familiar and to uh, be edified encouraged by the church fathers yep that's a good question the question was uh, for the video uh, how can protestants uh, what resources can protestants avail to themselves to get a good grip on the church fathers um, at the moment, I'm reading a wonderful autobiography by Thomas Oden, who's a brilliant Methodist um, scholar and theologian. It's a great journey um, how he went from a very radical left-wing environment into uh, orthodox, and he got there from reading the Church Fathers. And so he's dedicated the last 30 or 40 years of his life to uh, bringing the Church Fathers back to uh, the contemporary church, particularly the, uh, the mainline churches and the evangelical churches. And probably the best thing he's, he's done is the ancient Christian commentary on scripture, which are a number of uh, books published by IVP that are commentaries on biblical books like Ephesians, Hosea, and Romans, but they have, they're, they're peppered with quotes from the church fathers. So I think a resource like that is probably the, the best way to start. And there's another series in that book called um, Ancient Christian Doctrine where they go through the Apostles' Creed, you know, basically one line per book, and they then bring all these quotes out from the church fathers, looking at the, the doctrines like, you know, one God, maker of heaven on earth, Jesus Christ, his only son, 
that kind of a thing. So if, if you want a starting point to get some more church fathers into your theology, they are pristine resources that should be on your bookshelves. One at the back here. Oh, sorry, down the front. Thank you so much for the spirit of this talk. It's really great. Um, question, you said you talked about um, provisional interpretation. Uh, I was just wondering, do you intend that to be all-inclusive? Like an example would be um, Jesus is the Christ. I, I don't hold to that uh, provisionally. Would you say that all interpretation of all scriptures should be held provisionally? Um, no, I would say when it comes to, this is interfacing with the clarity of scripture. Okay, there are some, some bits like, you know, like when Jesus came to Capernaum, it doesn't mean he went to um, Chick-fil-A in Georgia. Okay, we can, you know, no, that's not going to change. Uh, but you might get some, you know, some other, th other things might be provisional. I'm thinking more in the way you use scripture to construct doctrine. For example, uh, should we dunk babies or not? Um, or baptize babies? Or what kind of church government should we have? Uh, but there are some places where it will be revisional. I mean, like Jesus is the Christ is pretty hard to deny. But is the righteousness of God a subjective genitive or an objective genitive? Um, should, should we interpret Revelation 24 to 6 as millennial or amillennial? Um, a good example of, of a provisional interpretation would be uh, probably that text. On the, on the, the, do you take the millennium in, Re in Revelation 20 literally? And uh, I remember uh, Tom Schreiner from Southern Seminary, um, that upstart guy I was telling you about. Um, uh, I, I found a wonderful sermon online where he, he talked about how he changed from being amillennial to historic premillennial. I thought this was great, so I got my students to listen to it, and they loved it. And I emailed Tom and said, oh, Tom, this was a great lecture you did at Clifton Baptist Church. Was, I, I put online, my students loved it, about how you've gone from amillennial to a historic premillennial. He says, oh, yeah, since then I've gone back to amillennial. That's a good example of provisioning. I don't know if that's back and forth. Maybe, maybe it depends on what, whether he has a hot breakfast or not in the morning. depends on what he believes. I don't know. But there are some texts that will be provisional. And there's some stuff, if anyone thinks they've got every single text, every doctrine worked out, I don't believe them. So I don't think anyone does. I, I think linking it to clarity of Scripture and how, your explanation of clarity of Scripture mm. works well. That's how I understand it as well. I was just wondering. I wanted the clarity. Oh, I, yeah, I wouldn't, say, I wouldn't say everything's up for negotiation. Some things are just, I think, uh, analytically true and self-evident. But there are the, the more difficult areas which I think um, are up for grabs. Yeah, or up for change. And revision. Thank you. Um, in terms of resourcing the church, uh, in terms of secondary literature, not you know, um, in terms of commentaries, I've been encouraging um, things like N.T. Wright's Everyone series yeah. and um, the New International Commentary, the New Testament, the Old Testament. Yeah. Um, is there any, do you, I, I'd be interested in hearing what all of you think about this. Um, is there any others out there that would be a really good resource for outfitting the church? Yeah. Um, there, there are a number of good commentary series. I mean, there are just so many. Um, more than there used to be. Um, I remember a good friend of mine, Scott McKnight, he said when he was young, basically the only commentary on Matthew you had was like spiritual commentaries, or I think there's like A.H. McNeil on Matthew or something like that. Now, it's just like huge. And um, most commentary series in my mind tend to be hit and miss. You have some really absolute standout gems in the series. Um, and then you have a few, to be honest, a few duds uh, or a bit lackluster performance. So I don't tend to go for any for particular series. I normally tend to go for individual volumes. In saying that, I actually am the editor for two series, and those series are pretty good. Um, uh, the New Covenant Commentary series I edit with Craig Kinner. There's some good volumes in that. And uh, as well, the, uh, what's called the Story of God Bible Commentary series, which is just starting. And there's a couple of good volumes and that have come out already uh, by uh, Scott McKnight, Lynn, uh, Lynn Cowick on Philippians, and John Byron on 1 and 2 Thessalonians. And I have to say, in terms of a, a, a commentary series for pastors, uh, the Story of God Bible commentary is very good because it's got a good mix of interpretation, but it's also got a lot on application. And I'll be perfectly honest, as someone who preaches myself, where I need the most help is not usually in the exegesis. There's a stack of commentaries like that. What I really need help with is moving into the application part, because that's 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 really where that's really where the the, the money is the, the money is not made. But that's really where the rubber hits the road, if you know what I mean. So, yeah. So all commentary series are hit and missed, except for the two I edit. The guy at the back's been very patient. <laughs> 
Yes, Dr. Bird, um, regarding the three worlds or the three horizons of interpretation that you talked about, um, could you tell us a little bit more about what is lost uh, when we ignore or don't pay as much attention to the world in front of or the context or the horizon of the reader? So what we lose, not so much in terms of yeah. application, but in terms of meaning if we don't focus yeah. on that. Exactly. You've got to recognize that people bring with them a story formed and half-formed. So no one, no one is a blank, a blank slate. Let me tell you the funniest story I've ever heard, a funniest story. A, uh, a missionary in Thailand gave a copy of the four Gospels to a Buddhist monk. Okay, so a missionary in Thailand. And uh, he then met with the, with the Buddhist monk about a month later. And the monk was very excited to see him. And the monk said to, them, to, the, to, the, to the missionary, this, this Jesus man, d did you know he is God? And the missionary goes, yeah. And the monk said, did you know he is even greater than the Buddha. And the missionary thinks, yeah, this is good. I'm going to reel this guy in. This is the first convert for the town. And he, he says to the Buddhist monk, what made you think that Jesus is God greater than the Buddha? Oh, he says, it's easy. See, Jesus is born and then he dies. He's born and then he dies. He's born and then he dies. He's born and then he dies. And then they call him God. It, it, took, him only, it took him only four incarnations to become God. It took the Buddha a thousand he was reading the Gospels as four consecutive incarnations where he kind of got crucified each time. But th that, that, was the, that was the background he was bringing. Or there's a story of a, um, of a uh, science student in Oxford who was given a book of Revelation to read. And he was asked by the local uh, campus crusade guy, he said, so what do you think of the New Testament? And he goes, well, it's a bit repetitive at the beginning, but the science fiction at the end is pretty good. You see, people bring preconceived expectations and they read it through a grid. And that can have some very, uh, that can have positive sense or bad sense. Like if you're from the Middle East, there are certain elements of Middle Eastern culture you may resonate with. But, and here's the other side, if you grew up white in um, apartheid South Africa, you would, by habit, by upbringing, read the Bible as a pro-apartheid book. And you would read things like, and so it can have both a neg negative and a positive. And you have to recognize that readers bring something to the text, both the good and the bad. So you, you can't say that, that readers are just fill their mind with the text and the author. There is something they bring to the text. And uh, to, sorry, readers, because of their context, they are part of the process by which meaning is created. They're not just receiving, they are bringing to the task. And often that can be a very good thing. Like I said last week, I was learning stuff about the Bible, hearing my African-American students talk you know, about growing up you know, in the South, in black culture, stuff I'd never heard before, and elements of the text that resonate with them and stand out. Uh, that kind of a thing. So I think we have to accept it. It's not just about authorial intent, not just about text. Readers are part of the process. Now, you can end up going to some crazy places like read a response criticism. You don't have to go that far. Uh, read Kevin Van Hoots's Is There a Meaning in the Text? That can put the brakes on that. Uh, I know some radical reader response people who kind of went very far then kind of pulled it back a bit. But we have to say it's about author text and reader. It's not just about what's behind the text, in the text, it's in front of the text as well. I found that point to be very helpful, but I'm curious to see where you would locate authority if we think of the, the Bible as being authoritative. Okay, exactly. The, uh, well, I'm talking about the interpretive task. For me, as the Westminster and London Baptist Confession say, our authority is not Scripture. Our authority is the Holy Spirit speaking in Scripture. Uh, that's an important distinction. Uh, it's a minor one, but it's an important one. A scripture is authoritative only because it has the Holy Spirit speaking in it in inspiration and continually speaking through it as God addresses the church. Too often Protestants have left out the, the pneumatic element of uh, their doctrine of scripture. That's why I did my own Christian theology and I did, I did this crazy wacky weird thing. Rather than put the doctrine of scripture as the first thing, I made it the doctrine of scripture a subset of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Now some people think I'm kind of cray cray. That's okay, that happens. Uh, that does happen, um, but I think I'm right. But uh, authority is, is located in God and God who speaks in Scripture. Uh, the problem is, though, and I can think of some horrible examples of this, people often preach the authority of Scripture, but often they mean the authority of their interpretation. 
And that's when it can get very uh, painful and very difficult. And over coffee, I could talk about some examples of that. Thank you. Yep. One more. One more. Here we go. Yeah, on that point you were making, you quoted uh, 1 Timothy 3.16. Yep. And I think that's mistranslated often. It takes pneumos and says breath and comes mm. up with inspired. Yeah. Instead of taking pneumos as spirit yeah. and saying permeated with God's spirit. Yeah. So I, th I think it says all scripture is permeated with the spirit of God. Yeah. And so it's your interaction with the spirit that makes it authoritative. Yeah. Uh, I can go in one better. Luke Timothy Johnson, that there's, sorry, let me back up. There's a passage in, uh, in the pastoral letters that says all scripture is God breathed. That's, that's the normal translation. Uh, but you could say that all scripture is inspired or infused with, um, all scripture is infused by the spirit. Uh, Luke Timothy Johnson's got an interesting take on that. He says uh, the main role of the spirit is to give life. And he talks about you know, how God's life giving power in, in Genesis and in the Psalms. And Luke Timothy Johnson says, takes that to mean all scripture is life giving because, it, because, it's, because it's born of the spirit. Which is, I'm not convinced, but it's an interesting take on that verse. But um, yeah, I think, I think the actual word is, it's, it's, it's a neologism, theo, theonustos, any Greek gurus know that? Yeah. So, but it's an interesting passage. Okay, well, thank you very much for your time. I've, uh, we've had a wonderful start to the day, and uh, I'm certainly looking forward to what our esteemed speakers have to say later on. Thank you very much.